The ashes of today are the sparks of tomorrow by XX Misery Smiles XX. Read by Kind Bed. Chapter 30. At Hawks Official. Been a while, hasn't it? LOL. Thanks for the number one spot. Since one of you guys apparently posted a photo of me earlier and got my name trending, thought I'd get back on here and make an official statement. 1. I don't know if slash when I'll get back into hero work. Third one of question mark. Tweeted at 10.50 p.m. At Hawks Official. As you may have noticed, my wings are still regrowing. Since the attack, I no longer have the ability to control them and don't think I will ever regain it. However, I still want to help people in any way possible, even if it no longer means being a hero. Thread 2 of question mark. Tweeted at 11.01 p.m. At Hawks Official. 2. Yes, I have seen the photos of me with the other guy. While I'm not saying anything until I've had the chance to properly talk with him, I want to confirm that some of the rumors are true. Yes, he is my boyfriend. Thread 3 of 3. Tweeted at 11.10pm. 8.4k likes, 1.2k retweets. Dobby woke up to find Hawks already awake, scrolling through his phone with pursed lips, and gently running his talons through the tangles in Dobby's hair. They hadn't had much time to shower or get ready last night, the two of them crashing into Hawks' bed and falling asleep as Ogawa had stirred on in disappointment. Moving to rest his chin on Hawks' shoulder, he gave a soft hum, tilting his head. Hawks tilted the phone so he could see, Dobby's heart sinking as he looked at the photos. It was them, together, a shot of Hawks and him. Hawks clearly recognizable with his, even small, wings fanned out behind him, and Dobby in his button-up and tie. Long white hair pulled back into a short ponytail. Hand on Hawks' waist as Hawks leaned up to peck him on the lips. Dobby sighed. There goes our peace. They don't know who you are, Hawks pointed out. It doesn't matter who I am, Kago, Dobby said, shaking his head. It matters that I'm dating you. You're the number one hero. People love a good tabloid. If you say anything, they'll pounce on it. Hawks winced. Does confirming it on Twitter count as saying something? Dobby gave him a look. You didn't. I didn't mention your name, just... He swiped over, then pulled up the tweets, showing them to Dobby, who smacked the palm against his forehead. Search up your name and tell me what the latest headline is. Hugs did so, and let out a confused chirp of surprise, feathers flaring and nearly smacking Dobby in the face. Down, bird. He is trying to sound annoyed, and ending up with his head tucked resting on Hawks' chest. The number one hero Hawks comes out on Twitter after long absence, shares photo of new boyfriend. Dobby scoffed. Shared? How about discovered? We didn't share shit. That's the least bad of them, Hawks mumbled, scrolling through. This one says it was a publicity stunt. I knew you were just leeching off my good looks and great ass. Dobby grumbled, moving so he could bury his face in Hawks' fluffy mass of chest feathers. Hawks raised an eyebrow. You know, the other day on call, Sogiyami was telling me about one of their classmates who keeps patting the tail of another. Sounds like a loser, Dobby said, voice muffled by feathers. Hawks gazed at him, unimpressed. Right. I'm still sleepy, Dobby admitted. Can we rest for a bit longer? Yeah, Hawks said, smiling and ruffling Dobby's hair. Shutting off his phone, he wiggled down, rolling onto his side and letting Dobby curl into his arms. Dobby let out a contented sigh before he closed his eyes and went back to sleep. Life could wait. His moment of peace, of quiet, couldn't. I love you. He mumbled. Love you too, hot stuff. Natsu. Last night, I found out that when my girlfriend is drunk, she doesn't know the difference between messages and Google. Attached. Screenshot of a text conversation. Sunflower. Dogs on their moon. Dogs on their moon. Where to find the, the girls on the imon? Natsu. Please don't send our dog to the moon. She's too fluffy. She'd die. Sad emoji. Sunflower. How had to a patrol in law? Natsu. Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. Sunflower. 
Breath e a in la anagia hanya natsu. Oh god. Sunflower. Can why sudden brother a in la to he to moon moon natsu. I'm sending this to Toya. Sunflower. Stupidi fish shit phoner. Natsu. Alameo. Please get some sleep of heart. Sunflower. Bastard. B. End attachment. Hawks. Why is this actually adorable? Hot stuff. What the actual fuck is this? Hawks. I thought you were on the moon. Why are you still talking shit? Hot stuff. I'm breaking up with you. Hawks. But I'm so hot. Sad face. Hot stuff. Chick emoji, gun emoji. Natsu. And you say me and Mora are insufferable. Hang on, wait. You got a phone? Hot stuff. Yeah, duh. Hawks. Now he can't steal mine. This is so tragic. Hot stuff. That's what you think. Hawks. Big smile emoji. Hey. Dobby looked up, letting out a breath as he locked with blue and gold eyes. Hawks had gone shopping with Murko for the day, and while Dobby adored him, he was not going shoe shopping with two people who didn't even have feet human enough to justify shoes. Besides, Dobby had to do this. He had to do it for himself and for his family. Shoto. Dobby replied, sliding into the chair across from them. They were in the center of a small coffee shop. Busy enough that their conversation would be drowned out by the chatter of fellow patrons. Shoto nodded to the mug in front of him. Natsu said you like ginger tea. I don't know how you take it though. Dabi flushed, touched by the kindness. Oh, thanks. Could he trust this? He fought the urge to narrow his eyes, search his brother's face for signs of deception. He trusted Hawks completely. Natsu mostly. Though the situation with Tomura had nearly been enough to make him run and burn the whole connection they'd built. Without the damn mood stabilizers keeping him grounded and Hawks there at his side to keep him sane, he probably would have. Haruka felt easy enough, but he didn't trust her really. Ogawa neither. He liked them, but he didn't trust them. Shoto was a wild card. This was Endeavor's weapon. Endeavor, who relished in finding new ways to hurt Toya, to burn into his mind and skin. Toya had learned not to trust a weapon, that he couldn't trust himself. Shoto was the same. Take things slow. It might not be what you want, but either way, I'll be here to hold you when it's over. Kegel's words echoed in his head, and Dobby breathed out. How are you? Fine. Shoto shrugged. You? Dobby's mind flooded with a tangle of thoughts, trying to pick apart all those words could mean. Taking his therapist who he did not trust, but was unfortunately usually right. Advice. He turned to the pyre he'd built in the back of his mind, letting the extra thoughts be tossed onto it and burn away in a jet of blue fury, smoke clearing his mind. Well, someone got pics of Hawks and I at lunch last week, so we've been under fire for that. But I think I'm taking the heat well. He took a sip of tea. Shoto nodded, then paused. Was... That's supposed to be a pun? Dobby snorted, the tea burning his mouth. Yes, I'm actually hilarious, if Natsu didn't mention it. Shoto sipped their coffee. He said you and Hawks kept making terrible puns and annoying him. At Dobby's shocked squawk of offense, they paused. Hang on, was that one of those gossip things that's rude to repeat? Should I have lied? Dobby shook his head. That little shit. No, you're good. Oh. Shoto looked relieved. Good. Because he's right, and I don't like lying. Unless it's Twaizawa, I guess. Kaminari says that if I see him sneaking out of Hitoshi's room, I have to lie to Aizawa, or we all lose the game. They paused. I think they're in a cult. Dabi choked on his drink, eyes widening. A cult? Shoto nodded seriously, leaning in on their elbows. They were in a long, light blue checked skirt, 
and white knit turtleneck Dobby was pretty sure Fuyumi had been wearing the other day. They didn't look like a weapon, not the way they had in the sports festival. They looked kind, the type of person who could abandon me, the type that could hurt me, or maybe someone he could genuinely come to trust. I learned on a podcast the other day about Big Mo, which is actually trying to sell the concept of bones to us as a secret ideal so we invest in them. Meanwhile, they're working with Feel Good Inc. and the Lizard Nation to build a skeleton army and take down the government. Thankfully, the commission was hit before their inside men could carry out the first strike. You know the children they found being trained? All of them were just lambs, little skeletons waiting to be harvested. Midoriya has taken a stand against them, and I'm trying to join, but I think Kaminari and Hitoshi might be too far gone. They're too close with the Lizard Nation already. Kaminari has started wearing the gang symbol of the Ninja Turtles as proof of his true alignment. Dabi stared, processing everything his brother was saying. Taking a deep breath, he nodded. It made sense with what he knew. Society was a corrupted place, fundamentally. He was glad, to an extent, Spinner hadn't ever become too high-ranking in the League. The Lizard Nation didn't need an end like that. You know Tokuyami? He asked slowly, and Shoto tilted their head, like a cat. Yes. I think he's Mothman, and I have proof. Shoto leaned in. Tell me. Later, when Hawks picked them up from the small downtown coffee shop he'd gone to, Dabi was buzzing with an ominous air, eyes flaring. We can't trust Ogawa, he announced. She's being controlled by them. Them? Hawks asked, glancing over. Big milk. Dabi clarified. Hawks begged, forgot to send him strength. She's a cat, Dobbs. I know, and that's just the start. They're targeting heteromorphs, because they know that predators could be a threat to their reign. They need us docile if they ever come above ground. He waved a hand for emphasis, while Hawks just stared at the road. Did you guys talk about anything important? This is important, Dabi insisted. You're a hero. This is society we're talking about. Your society. Hawks shook his head. Remind me why I ever agreed to date you. Chapter 31 Minor content warning. This chapter depicts a character majorly disassociating to a point of not knowing their own age. While the POV is not on the disassociated character, this still could be triggering to those who experience disassociation. So take care and skip the second half if you need to. Rumi! A hux! Hugs bounded over, enveloping his spring-footed friend into a hug and kissing her cheek. You ready to roll? Merkel flexed her good arm, grinning maniacally. Let's shop till we fucking drop. Hawks had desperately missed this. He hadn't felt this normal in months, but Rumi was comfortable to be around, and she never treated him differently from the rest. Her and Dobby had that in common, but Rumi had a layer of carefree life lust to her that Hawks needed sometimes. Yumi and my future sister-in-law are heading to a convention this summer, and Muda wants to go as Overwatch characters. Yumi called Mei and told Mura is going to be Mercy, but I need to know. She whipped out her phone and held up a side-by-side -side panel of two characters. Diva or Symmetra? Hawks considered it. Well, Symmetra has your body type and skin tone, but Diva has the whole bunny thing going on, so... He shrugged. I mean, I think you'd rock both. Rumi sighed, thumping her foot against the ground. <sighs> Which would make a better hot lesbian wife to Mei? Hawks laughed. Definitely Diva then. Got it. Rumi pumped a fist in the air before grabbing Hawks' arm again and dragging him towards the spunky jewelry store. Hawks followed her, reaching up to touch his ears. He hadn't worn earrings in a while. It might be worth it to get a new pair. But first... Hey, Rumi. He asked carefully. She looked up from where she was trying on a pair of gold cuff bracelets, tilting her head. What's up? Did... Did Yumi tell you what happened on Children's Day last week? Hawk swallowed hard, glancing around to avoid her gaze. Rumi whistled, nodding. Oh, yeah. Her villain older brother showed up out of nowhere and was trying to scare people or something. Were you there for that? 
Hugs for his stomach sink. Yeah, he brought his boyfriend. Seriously? That's... Then she paused, looking at him. Hugs, didn't someone leak photos of you and your boyfriend at the gathering? Yeah. Hugs said, vaguely sick. Rumi rubbed at her forehead. Fuck. You're dating Yumi's brother, aren't you? Hugs nodded, looking at the ground. Yeah. Rumi just shook her head. Well, fuck me. This is a fun situation for the family. Does she know you two are dating? Hawks made a helpless gesture. She didn't really give him any time to speak. She just slapped him, started yelling, and then told him to fuck off. God, that sounds so hot, Rumi whispered, then winced at Hawks' expression. And also, not the greatest, Rumi sighed, putting the bracelet cuffs back and picking up a scarlet necklace. I'm going to say I'm probably missing part of the story at this point then. Because I know you wouldn't date someone who genuinely abused his family. But Fuyumi isn't some irrationally angry ass. I mean, if I wanted some hot, confident jerk ass, I'd just date myself. She'd stop to let out a loud cackle. Fuck, I'm hilarious enough that I might. But besides that, I really think something must have been lost in translation here. Hawks nodded, fiddling with the clasps on a beaded necklace. You're probably right. Rumi gently removed it before he accidentally broke it, shaking her head. What do we do with them, old friend? We're part of this family now, and so it's about us too. I love you and Yumi equally, and if she wants me to pick sides, I don't think I'd know what to do. Hugs gave her a thumbs up as she showed off a pair of dangly silver earrings. Plus, you kinda invited Dobby to the wedding, so that's gonna be hella awkward. Rumi paused. So many things just occurred to me, and I don't know where to start. She sighed. You're actually dating the guy who burnt your wings off? Are you a masochist or something? Actually, hold up, don't answer that. I'd like to die not knowing some things. Either way, you're making some real interesting choices. Hux spluttered. You told me to go after him. Rumi gave him a look. Yeah. You said he told you his name, not that he revealed his secret villain past. That is a very big difference. She sighed. Does he make you happy? Hawks nodded. You don't even know. For the first time in my life, I think I actually know what it's like to actually be happy. He's... He cares so much, and he makes me feel like I might actually be worth something. Like I don't have to be a hero to mean something. That I can be a normal person, and it won't make me a worthless fucking waste of oxygen. His chest tightened, and Rumi stared at him, eyes wide. Oh my god, Hawks, baby, why would you think that? Who on earth made you believe that? I think it might have been me, Hawks admitted as she pulled him into a tight hug. Well, tell Hawks he's a fucking idiot, because you're worth so much, hero or not. And if he doesn't believe you, tell him that his sexy as fuck best friend Miracle says so, and she's always right. Hawks laughed. Thanks. Tell her I love her. Oh, I love you too, you big sappy baby. And your stupid ex metal detector boyfriend or whatever. She gave him a squeeze before stepping back to announce. I'm getting these earrings. You better get those pretty blue ones you've been ogling. Today is about treating ourselves. Hawks complied. Paid at the cash register. The cashier was a big fan and took a photo with Miracle before they walked out and headed on to the next adventure. He didn't mention that he only bought the earrings because they were the same startling turquoise of Toby's eyes. He was pretty sure she might actually punch him if he did. Maybe we should try doing a video call, Hux suggested. That way they can talk without being in the same room and we could quickly end things if they don't go well. Rumi nodded thoughtfully, then snorted. I feel like we're trying to socialize two bitchy cats. I mean, Hawk shrugged as they slipped under a bright storefront of a mandrake. That's pretty much Dobby in a nutshell, yeah. Rumi laughed, shoving him on the shoulder. I'll talk it over with Yumi. It sounds like a good plan, though. She turned to the tired woman behind the counter, giving a dazzling grin. Hey, do you have any Overwatch cosplay pieces in? Not sure. Depends a lot on the character. Oh my fucking god, are you Miracle? The woman flushed bright red, 
mouth hanging open as she seemed to register who she was talking to. Marco cackled. Oh yeah, it is. The woman turned, ducking out from behind the counter and waving a hand. Follow me. I'll go look in the bag. Oh my god, sorry. Who are you cosplaying again? Diva, Rumi said, tugging Hawks along with her. I'm headed to a con this summer with my wife and her brother's girlfriend. It's gonna be so fucking lit. She gave a megawatt smile and Hawks swore he heard the cashier whimper. She turned back to him, tilting her head. If Muraki would do someone else, you'd make one hell of a mercy, she considered, poking at his feathers. Or maybe Tracer. I bet Muraki could do an amazing Anna. And Yumi looks beautiful in anything. The cashier turned and promptly dropped the hook bar she'd been holding. Oh my god, you're Hawks. Hawks gave a lazy smile and wink. Guilty as charged. How you doing? Rumi gave him a look and sighed, shaking her head. Horrible. You're absolutely horrible. The cashier picked the bar back up finally stopping to shuffle through a rack of fluffy costumes. It is your boyfriend here, then? She asked, looking nervously to Hawks. Rumi and him both grimaced. Uh, Rumi said hesitantly. No. He's getting coffee with his brother, Hawks supplied, but I'll see him later, if you want me to say hi. He meant it as a joke, but the cashier looked hopeful. Y you would? Sure, Hulk said, a bit taken aback. I guess, yeah. Finally, the cashier quit fumbling, shaking her head. I don't think we have a diva costume in right now, but we've got her headphones in, or at least once inspired by her model. If I could give you my phone number, I could text you when we have an actual costume in. Rumi's eyes lit up. Really? Hell yeah, give me your hand. She took the cashier's wrist uncapping a black marker from the pocket of her sparkly black skirt and scribbling down her number. Then, with a quick farewell, they turned to leave. I think you just made that girl's day, Hawks murmured, raising an eyebrow. You seriously good with giving your number out like that? Rumi raised an eyebrow. Dude, you told me you gave your number out to a villain once. Hawks flushed brilliantly, averting his eyes, and Rumi stilled. Oh my god. Was that Dobby? Hulk said nothing, which was response enough. Rumi threw her hands up in the air. You've had it bad for him for years, haven't you? On one hand, this is the best job you've ever done at keeping a secret from me. On the other hand, that's just sad. Hulk decided to just give in and admit it. That, yeah, even before the whole Toby situation... He'd had a bit of a thing for Dobby. He remembered one night, standing on the rooftop of an office building around the back parts of town, Dobby's coat falling slightly down his shoulder, his collarbone smooth and marble under the moonlight, his eyes just a little too blue, his piercings glinting, and Hawks had moved forwards, let Dobby slip a hand to rest on his hip, pulled him closer by his waistband, and then they both gone. Nothing had happened. Sometimes Hawks wished it had. He wondered if he'd given in, if he let Dobby hold him down, kiss his neck, and set him free, if he'd killed twice though, if he'd have betrayed the League. Maybe not, but then again. He had what he wanted now, didn't he? Not at the cost of Kuragiri, of Spinner, of Twice, of Toga, of Atsuhiro, of all the people Dobby cared about. You still help destroy them. Hey, Rumi said, slapping at his cheek. Stop being emo. I can see you, you know. Your eyes are going all distant. I'm not having that on our one day off. Right, Hulk sighed, pulling himself out of his head. Sorry. He flashed a pained smile her way. She softened, gently touching his cheek and tilting their faces so she could give him a sincere look. Things are going to work out. You gotta stop worrying all the time. I'm your best friend, and I ain't leaving you anytime soon. Now, let's go get our clothes painted and gossip about Natsu and Tomura, because that whole thing is so fucking weird, and I know you totally want to make fun of how whipped she's got him. This actually managed to pull a laugh from Hawks, who shook his head, 
following her into a salon called Kiritsume. Rumi, he said, wiping tears from his eyes when he finally stopped giggling. Don't ever change. This is the second half of the chapter if you'd like to skip it. Toby recounted his new theories to Ogawa and Haruka over dinner, which Haruka politely indulged, and Ogawa impolitely mocked. I'm sorry, but your younger brother is insane. Someone please sit him down and explain the earth is round or whatever. Shoto prefers to use gender neutral terms, actually. Dabi corrected. Brother is okay, though. Oh, sorry, Ogawa said. Thanks for letting me know. She shook her head. But seriously, I'm fairly certain they've been watching too much YouTube or something. Lizard people don't exist. At least not in the underground society sense. Dabi raised an eyebrow. They obviously do. They literally made quirks. I'm sorry? Ogawa barked out. What? Dabi threw up his hands. The whole thing about humanity evolving into them is bullshit. Because of things like Principle Nezu. The evolutionary processes of different species wouldn't be able to accommodate the linear evolutional inevitability model they're trying to push onto us. Especially because the whole concept of mutation quirks in the first place. The replication of animal DNA sequencing isn't realistic or fitting for the progression of human adaptations. Clearly, quirks were bioengineered into us by someone who wanted to use them for their own gains. Someone who wanted to change society so drastically that a few iguana people or cryptids wouldn't be questioned. Someone like the lizard society. He smacked a hand on the table, gaze fierce. And that's where big milk comes in. Predator subduction. That's not even how you use that word. Oh my fucking- Hux felt his phone buzz with an email notification and pulled it out. Glad to have a distraction before either of his friends tried to pull him into taking a slide. With their steadily growing arguing filling the background, Hux opened his email and froze. He hadn't expected this for at least a month or so. Maybe being number one meant he was giving higher priority? If so, he never had been so grateful for it. Dobby. He breathed, grabbing Dobby's hand. They approved my request to oversee your recovery. You officially can stay with me when we leave. You won't have to go to prison. You can go home. The former conversation dropped in an instant, Ogawa and Haruka letting out shouts of delight and Toby simply sitting looking shocked. Let... He started, voice barely audible. Let me see. He reached out, and Hawks handed him the phone. Toby took it and shaking hands, reading over the email. When he was done, he sat down, took a deep breath, and studied his hands, shaking slightly. Hawks put a hand to his back. You good? No, I'm... I'm happy, Toby said, voice strained. It's just... It's too much. I can't... I can't think. I can't... I can't feel my legs. I'm... Why am I going home? I... I... Hawks took Dobby's hand in his own, placing it over Hawks' chest and taking a deep breath. Dobby, can you feel me breathing? I... Dobby shuddered slightly. Are you real? Hawks took a long moment. He'd seen this happen before a few times, and thankfully, Ogawa had given him some tips on what to do. The first time he'd panicked, when Dobby had stopped responding to his name, barely registering Hawks' presence. Can I move you? He asked quietly. Dobby stared ahead, eyes vaguely glassy. Yeah, he said, not moving an inch. Hawks gently pulled him to standing, walking with him to the door. Ogawa followed, pointing down the hall. There's a soundproof room down there we use for patients who are stressed out. Hawks thanked her quietly, leading Dobby inside and sitting them down, shutting the door. When Hawks let him go, though just for a second, Dobby shuddered, hands moving in front of him in a motion like he was unsure what they were doing. Hawks quickly sat down again, taking his hands. Hey, can you see me? Dobby didn't respond, shaking, eyes still glazed over. Hawks took a breath. How old are you? I... Dobby blinked slowly. Fourteen. No, that's... He shook his head. I... Where am I? 
You're in a room, in Japan, Hawk said soothingly, gently tracing the lines of Dobby's poem, hoping the touch might help. Where did everyone go? Dobby murmured, his free hand going and trying to loosely claw his cheek. Fiumi, and not. Hawks gently took his hand away from his face, holding them both to his chest. They're okay. Do you want to talk to them? He took mom away, Dobby said numbly. He's gonna take me away. I need to. I need. His breathing picked up, panic taking over, and Hawks quickly reached out, touching the side of his face. Shh, it's okay. No one's taking you away. He isn't here right now. He'll hurt them, Dobby insisted, grip tightening, and hand going back to try and scratch at his face. Hawks pulled out his phone, never letting go of Dobby, as he quickly flipped to Natsu's contact and texted him. I need you and Fuyumi on the line right now. Why? Was the response that came a few seconds later. Toya. That was apparently enough, because the call came in a few seconds later. Dobby didn't register the ringtone, not watching Hawks accept it, and set it to speakerphone. Hey, what's wrong? Do you... Natsu said, sounding worried. Natsu, Dobby asked, voice flat and distant, but slightly clearer now. Toya, what's up? A note of hesitance stretched in Natsu's voice, clearly sensing something was wrong. See? Hawk said soothingly. He's here. You aren't alone. Everyone is safe. If you me. Dobby said, eyes flickering with fear for a second. She's not picking up. I think... Oh, hang on. There was a few moments of silence where Hawks tried to talk through, trying to keep Dobby present. Ogawa stood to the side still, waiting in case Hawks needed her help. Natsu? A clearer voice called, questioning, and Dobby tensed slightly. Is Dad home? He asked, shaking slightly again. Toy, not. What's going on? Fuyumi said, now sounding concerned. Is Shoto safe? Dabi asked foggily, and Fuyumi let out a breath. Yes, he is. Toya, are you okay? No, Dabi whispered, shoulders shaking again. Is dad home? No, Natsu finally said, and Dabi seemed to relax a fraction. Hawks took the opportunity to try and ground him again. Hey, Dobbs. Toya, can you take a deep breath for me? Dobby did so after a second. Hawks let out a soothing chirp. Good. That's good. Hey, Toya, Fuyumi said, more assured now. Dad doesn't live with us anymore. Shoto and him aren't allowed to legally live together. He isn't coming home. Her words were slow, soothing. Mom is home, though. We can go see her later. Dobby's breath hitched. But my training... I need to keep training. Training? Fuyumi asked. We're gonna take you to a doctor, and they're gonna make sure you can keep training, okay? Not to cut in. And you won't have to be burned anymore. It'll be okay. Keep breathing, Hawk said, when Dobby faltered for a moment. Promise? Dobby asked quietly. Promise you aren't leaving. His voice sounded smaller, younger almost. Promise. Dad isn't coming back. Natsu affirmed. Hawks gently moved Dobby's hand, so it touched his wing. Can you feel my feathers? I... Dobby blinked twice, shuddering for a moment. Then he looked up, eyes clearer. Hawks? Hawks let out a relieved warble. Yeah. Yeah, it's me. It's me, Firefly. Dobby reached out for him, seeming not entirely back in focus, but still determined to have Hawks hold him. Hawks buried his face in Dobby's hair, stroking his back. I'm here. You're okay. Is everything okay? Fuyumi asked, still sounding panicked. It's okay now. Sorry. Hawks assured. I think he had a minor dissociative episode. Just a lot of stress and big things going on. Thanks for picking up on short notice. Okay, that's good. Fuyumi sounded relieved. Does... does that happen a lot? Sometimes. Hawks admitted. I don't want to speak too much on it when he isn't able to chime in. There was a long moment. Then Fuyumi spoke. I didn't know he trained with Dad. How could you not know? Natsu snapped, sounding annoyed. Fuyumi quickly continued. 
I don't remember a lot of our childhood. I remember Shoto crying a lot and cooking and mom going away and Toya trying to hurt Shoto, but... Oh, Natsu said, then took a deep breath. Dad started training Toya from when he was four. I used... I used to help bandage him up afterwards. I used to help bandage him up afterwards. Oh, God. Fumi's voice was small. Then she breathed in. I... Can I come visit tomorrow? I don't know, Hawk said truthfully. I'll have to ask Dobby. Okay, Fiumi agreed. I think... I think we need to talk. Content warning. Second half of this chapter has mentions of gaslighting, post-traumatic amnesia, heavily implied suicidal ideation, reference sexual assault and child abuse. There are no direct flashbacks or graphic depictions, but it does come up, so skip it if it may be triggering. Thanks for helping, Ogawa, Hawk said, once they hung up on the siblings. The cat hummed. It goes against my better judgment to let a patient handle something like this, but I think having someone trustworthy to ground him may have been the best bet here. Mm hmm. Hawk stroked fingers through Dobby's hair. Do you really think he trusts me? Ogawa shrugged, crossing her arms as she leaned back against the wall. Maybe. I struggle with trust a lot, and he acts around you like I would act around someone I trust. Oh. Hawks blinked. He knew he should probably have trust issues, but something in him felt almost blindly trusting, like he'd been conditioned. Oh fuck, he had. He wondered if it was a bad thing that he didn't struggle more with trust. Or maybe it was one of the things that made him and Dobby work. Between blind trust and zero faith, they came out somewhere resembling normal. I suppose I should mention it at this point, Ogawa bit her lip. I have schizophrenia. I, I don't feel comfortable telling you anything about how it started or what it's like, but it is something about me that does come up every once in a while, so... You should be aware. Oh. Hawks breathed out. He didn't know how to respond to that. I... Thanks for trusting me with that. You're welcome. Please don't share it with anyone else. If that's alright. Ogawa told him seriously, and Hawks nodded. I normally would feel sharing that too personal, but seeing as you're only going to be here for a week longer at most, our relationship won't remain professional for much longer. She grinned slightly, and Hawks laughed quietly, careful not to wake Dobby, who had drifted off to sleep. I'm a bit scared to leave, to be honest. Hawks admitted. Ogawa mewed sympathetically. Transition can be scary, but try and think over a plan. You and Toby plan on getting an apartment, right? Hawks nodded. Yeah, then Toby wants to go back into education, so he can go into court counseling, and I... I might apply for a teaching position. I talked about it with President Mike the other night, and he said he could write me a recommendation if I needed that. That and my number one position probably would get me the job. Ogawa smiled. See? You've got a plan. You'll do fine. Hawks let a soft smile fall over his face. Yeah, I will. Dobby's eyes flutter open. His head raised in blearily confusion. Okay. You awake, baby. Hugs chirped, and Dobby nodded, pushing himself back. Sorry about that. No worries, Firefly. Hawks reassured, kissing Dobby on the tip of his nose. Happy to have you back. You feel better? Dobby groaned, stretching out like a cat. Not really. He blinked up hopefully. Can we rewatch the Mysterians? Sure, baby. Hawks obliged. Personally, he found the sci-fi films Dobby adored so much boring at best and painful at worst. But usually, it was worth it to watch Dobby's face react to everything and his snarky, sometimes overdone commentary. Where are you two going? Ogawa asked, raising an eyebrow, and both froze. Uh, Hulk said intelligently. Ogawa put her hands on his hips. Hulk's cowered. Ten minutes later, they were all set in the Toby cave, 
Ogawa cross-legged on the floor and crunching on Pocky. So this is where you go whenever you cause trouble, she said, shaking her head. I can't even be mad, because if I had found this first, I would absolutely have done the same thing. They'd made the sudden decision, not to mention this space was also their part-time love shack. Hulk settled in at Dobby's side, and sighed. If you want to just look at memes or something, I don't mind. You've gone through this like five times already, he murmured, and Hawks had never loved someone more as he pulled out his phone. Colonel Sanders. Guess who gets to be their boyfriend's probation officer? Lola Bunny. Hey, yo! Celebration emojis. Colonel Sanders. Thank you, thank you. Lola Bunny. Seriously, dude. Heart emoji. I'm so happy for you. Cow emoji. Me right now showering you with my love and joy. Colonel Sanders. OMFG, you're the best. Lola Bunny. I know I am, bitch. Yumi's going out with some teacher friends tomorrow, so I'm taking her out for dinner tonight. Cow emoji. We're gonna be the baddest bitches on the rotating sushi bar. Colonel Sanders. You so will be. Lola Bunny. W. Prince Sidon's wife. Could you two do this in DMs? I'm in a TF2 match and y'all blowing up my phone. Lola Bunny. No. Heart emoji. Prince Sidon's wife. Middle finger emoji. Colonel Sanders. LMAO. Hey. Dobby murmured before they fell asleep that night. When we have our own apartment, can we get a cat? Why? Hawks act sleepily. Full intelligence on display. I don't know. They're neat. I think it'd be fun to hang out with. Don't you have Shoto? Hawks pointed out. Shoto is a bitch. Dobby slurred gruffly, fingers lazily brushing through Hawks' feathers. And cats aren't. Hawks pointed out. Dobby just grumbled. Hawks let out an amused warble. Yeah, we can get a cat, baby bird. Fuck yeah. Dobby groaned. Eyelids fluttering closed. Love you. Dobby was already asleep. In the end, Fuyumi's visit was postponed for two days, so they'd be able to find a time when all four Todoroki siblings could stop in together. Toby's therapist has said it would be best if they could oversee the session, family therapy style, since they could help keep things on topic and make sure everyone got a chance to speak. That's how Hux ended up replacing Fuyumi for the Saturday night gaming session with Mariko and Tomura. Fuyumi and Rumi's apartment was spacey and comfortable, all sleek panels of dark wood and with a tantalizing view of the skyline, checked tile floors, and thin white curtains patterned with bunnies. Hey! Rumi said when she opened the door, standing in black slacks and a white shirt that said honey bunny in silver lettering. Come on in, bird brain. Get comfy. Hugs blinked out at the twinkling skyline, streaks of muted bright lights against spilled ink. Hey, nerd. A scratchy voice called out, and Hawks looked up to see Tomura at the far end of the white leather couch, hair spilled messily over her shoulders, dressed in a loose red t-shirt that hung off her shoulders and black jogging shorts. Did you bring any wine? No, Hawks said awkwardly, not remembering anything telling him to. Damn it, Tomura scowled. See, this is why Fiyumi is better. Oh, be quiet. Rumi scolded, throwing a pillow at her and flopping down onto the center of the couch, which Tomura blocked with an elbow. As Hawks maneuvered himself against the pillows and blankets strewn about, his ankles are swarmed by a yipping noise. He looked down to see a small white dog staring up at him defiantly with beady eyes. Kaiju, snapped Tomura, waving a hand. Down, come back over here. You aren't allowed to eat low-quality chicken. Rumi barked out a laugh, while the white puffball bounced back up onto Tomura's lap to make itself comfortable. She gave an amused snort as Tomura patted the pup's head. That dog is spoiled, I swear. Tomura, Tomura glared then shook her head, tossing a red game controller at Hawks, who fumbled to catch it. Get ready to rumble, loser. Head in the game. She pushed her hair back from her face with a hand. Rumi shoved the glass at him. I have some champagne. Not too much, Tomura warned. Can't have your tipsy ass screwing us over. 
Rumi scoffed, leaning over and whispering loudly. She's already had two glasses. I can hear you, you fuckface, Tomura snarled, hissing like a cat. Rumi stuck her tongue out, then clicked on the TV, turning up the volume as the Overwatch start screen flashed. As they split into four screens, Hawks felt his heart sink. Uh, how do you play? Tomura hissed again. Seriously? Why the fuck are you friends with him? He's a work in progress, dear, Rumi told her, thumping her foot against the floor as she selected a character Hawks recognized as Diva. Are you gonna be Mercy? Hawks asked Tomura, and she cackled. Fuck no. I'm not playing support. Widowmaker is my bitch. I can snipe like a motherfucker. You should take Mercy. She's a healer, and so as long as you can dodge pretty well, it's not a tricky character, Rumi suggested, and Hawks acquiesced, clicking the angelic woman. Besides, Rumi continued, Muraki only likes Mercy because she wants a winged mommy to crush her in between her thick, juicy, angelic. She broke off with a shriek of laughter as a white-gloved hand was clamped firmly over her mouth. Don't you fucking dare, Tomura threatened, red eyes blazing in tandem with her rosy cheeks. Hawks laughed, raising an eyebrow. Don't you literally both have partners? Isn't this, like, weirdo gamer cheating? Fictional, Fictional women, women don't, don't count. count. Tomura and Rumi said at the same time, and Hawks held up his hands. Jeez, okay, got it. Just saying. The music picked up, and the match started. Hey, Usagiyama, will you lie about something to feed me for me? Tomura asked, chewing on her lip as the battle map loaded. Huh? What? Rumi asked distractedly as they spawned into base. Tell her I've been wearing those white knit gloves she made me for Christmas. Tomura pleaded, while Rumi shook her head. Oh, honey, you made your bed there, now go lie in it. I'm not covering for your ass. If it's really that bad, just wear the damn gloves. Tomura groaned. Meanwhile, the first round of gunfire went off on the screen, and Hawks tried to get the motion controls to work for him in a way that didn't make him dizzy. I fucking hate wool, though. It's the texture, you know? Then tell her that. It's not that difficult. Fuck, Winston's coming at me from behind. Cover me. Hang on. There was a shot from off screen, and Hawk saw a guy go down. Meanwhile, he finally found out that when he clicked the button on the side, there was a yellow light, and the controller went nuts for a sec. He considered asking what that meant, then realized this would definitely garner the mockery of his friends. A quick glance at them made his mouth fall open. Rumi was moving fast, as expected. But Tomura was... Tomura was something else entirely. Her fingers were incredibly fast, calculated. While he'd always thought it was silly before, Hugs now found something akin to respect watching her work because goddamn, she was a boss. About three minutes later, their team won the match, and Rumi and Tomura let out a cheer, grabbing glittery champagne flutes and knocking them back like they were taking shots. It was still just the three of them, but it still felt like he'd walked into a bustling party. Hey, Hawks, Tamara said, grinning lazily. You want to wing it, beauty? What's that? Hawks asked, raising an eyebrow, and Tamara cackled before coughing. I don't fucking know. Just made it up. Hang on. She slid out her seat, disgruntled-looking puppy at her heels, grabbing a few bottles from the honestly feral amount of alcohol on the hanging shelf above the granite bar counter. A splash of what looked like grenadine, a few unlabeled clear bottles, and then something from the fridge that Tomura deliberately seemed to hide the label of, Rumi watched on in excitement the whole time, a mischievous light in her eyes. Game on pause the whole time. Finally, the scramble of clinking glass died down, and Tomura shimmied back, something reddish-orange and faintly dangerous-looking in hand. Drink this. Um... Hawk said ceremoniously, accepting the gift. Not to kill the party, but what is this? Winged beauty, said Rumi, pushing the glass closer. Drink up, loser. They looked at him almost hungrily, and fuck. Rumi might be a bunny, but Hawk swore that was a predator's gleam in her bright red eyes. When had his life become a repetitive cycle of white-haired maniacs talking him into increasingly fucked-up situations? 
For a second, he remembered the white-haired maniac waiting for him back at the hospital. His white-haired maniac. And he closed his eyes and drank. It wasn't bad, but it was strong. It burnt like a bitch. Scrunching up his nose, he swallowed. When we let out a whoop, grabbing the glass bag and hanging herself from his neck in an odd, violent parody of a hug. Fuck yeah, there you go. You're part of the fucking club now. She grinned lazily, and Hawks felt his chest flutter. Tomara clapped her hands together, bouncing in her seat. We gonna play another round? Hawks asked, taking another long drink of champagne. Not yet. Rumi pulled out her phone, skipping around until she found the contact she'd wanted. Someone named Namuri. The name sounded vaguely familiar. With a sly flick of her long ears, she added, Have you ever gotten a tattoo? This is the second half of the chapter if you'd like to skip it. No, Fuyumi admitted, shaking her head. The room was tense, sterile, and cold. Everything Dobby had forgotten hospitals were. His hand clenched into his pants, knuckles white. Fuyumi's head was lowered, Shoto and Natsu trying to look anywhere else but her. The therapist, Tamura-san, let out a breath. That's all right, Fuyumi. Have you ever sought out therapy or worked with a psychiatric care provider? Fuyumi shook her head again. No. Dabi tried not to let himself drown in all the emotions tugging at his chest and the urge he had to burn them all away. Half of him wanted to stumble into his sister's arms, sob into her chest, and beg her to hold him close like when they were kids, to tell him it'd be okay. The other half of him wanted to walk up, cup her cheeks gently, and then let his palms flare, watch her face melt, watch her scream and kick as she burned like he'd had to burn over and over and over and over and... Dobby shut his eyes, took a breath, and let the thoughts fall into the ever-lit pyre in his head. He thought of Hawks, probably bored out of his mind, playing video games with Rabbit Face and Brother Stealing Trader Mick Handy Hand. Having him here would make things feel easier. But, at the same time, the thought of having him hear exactly how bad their childhood had been made his stomach churn. They didn't need to invite people into the ever-tossing Todoroki family trauma washing machine. I'd recommend that you possibly look into it, Tamura recommended soothingly. Anyone can benefit from therapy, especially teachers like yourself. Life has a lot of little stressors, and talking to someone with experience and ways to handle them is a great way to work through it. Dabi noticed she specifically avoided mentioning Endeavor in any of it. He narrowed his eyes, unsure why. Was she trying to trick Fuyumi? Does she know something they didn't? Could they help me remember everything? Fuyumi asked quietly. Well, yes and no, she said gently. You may have heard of recovered memory therapy, or RMT which uses techniques such as hypnosis to unlock repressed memories. However, a lot of that research has been proven outdated, and so you won't encounter it as often anymore. Instead, cognitive therapy, or trauma-focused CBT, cognitive behavior therapy that is, would be my recommendation. Natsu snorted at CBT, turning slightly pale as the room turned to stare at him for a long minute. Tamura cleared her throat and continued. For now, I'd recommend for Natsu, Toya, and Shoto to try picking a memory you all remember clearly, taking turns describing it, and we can see if it helps jog anything. What about Christmas, on Shoto's fourth birthday? Natsu suggested. Toya swallowed thickly. It'd been his last Christmas with them. Okay, Shoto agreed softly. Fuyumi smiled. I think I remember that. We got KFC for dinner. And that has her night eye over. A long beat of silence stretched out. Toya was sick, Natsu said softly. Mom tried to get Dad to cancel our dinner plans, and he refused. She was crying, Shoto added. He hit her. She told me she was fine, but I knew she was lying. They looked at the floor, studying their boots. People were always lying. She was always crying. Natsu added bitterly. Fuyumi's face twisted for a moment. 
didn't you get sick during dinner? Toya dropped his head, nodding. Dad told Sir Night Eye that I'd been stealing snacks all afternoon and had just overdone it. Fucking laughed at me. He whispered. I... I remember that. I thought he was telling the truth. Fuyumi murmured. I had the flu. Toya spat, the vision flashing red for a moment. Dad only told Night Eye that because Night Eye had just broken up with All Might. And dear old Enji thought that he could get him on some kind of revenge. Night Eye said no, obviously. Because unlike Dad, he's not a manipulative ass. Are you serious? Natsu choked out. That's why we had him over? Oh my fucking... That petty bitch. Fuyumi stared blankly for a minute. Then gasped. Oh fuck. She brought a hand to her mouth, eyes watering. No, no, no. What? Natsu snapped, before Tamara put a hand up to give her time. She, Fuyumi stuttered out. I saw mom was yelling, and he said, be quiet and lay, and I walked in and he, they, she shook her head again. He was raping her. Oh my gosh, he was raping her. I remember he was... An odd sort of sick satisfaction settled in Dobby's gut, seeing his sister sob over the pain their father had inflicted over their family, breaking down like he'd been breaking for years. Then he remembered he didn't want her to hurt. Or, at least, that if he let her hurt now, he'd regret it later. So he reached out, touched her shoulder. He didn't expect Shoto to be the one to stand up. Of course he raped her, they gritted out. Hands clenched. Do you think I was made because someone wanted me? Do you think she burned me because she was happy for me to be born? None of us should have been born. I wish I wasn't born. I wish I didn't have to look into her face and know every time that everything about me was a mistake. They wiped at their face before any of the tears could fall. When Toya died, I wasn't sad. I was sad later. First, I was jealous. Because he'd made it out, and I was stuck. Their voice cracked, face flushed red against porcelain skin. The colors of their family's flag. A mosaic of anger and shame that Toya never saw the end of. Fiyumi was sobbing, silent, her breathing seeming barely controlled. She choked out, voice warbling. When we were in middle school, a boy raped me and dad got him expelled. A rushed clog of words, barely coherent. He lied, she said. And Dabi knew how it felt. He knew all too well. Everyone lied to us. Not so spat. Society told me Endeavor was a good person, and he wasn't. Mom said she'd protect us, and she couldn't. Toya said he'd stay, and he didn't. Shoto is right. People have always been lying to us. So sorry if I feel like I don't remember isn't enough. If I think it's an excuse or that you're a liar because that's all this family is. A bunch of miserable liars. Let's take a moment, Tamara said, stepping in. Natsu, while it's okay to feel that way, that doesn't mean that's all. Fuyumi may not have experienced the same things you did, and that's okay. She's entitled to have her own views of events and also acknowledge your feelings. Stop using that language, Shoto muttered quietly. Call him what he is. An abuser who abused us is not how we feel or our view of events. It's trauma, and he did all of it. He's trying to be... Fuyumi started, almost on instinct, and Natsu threw up his hands. You're the only one still trying to fight this battle. Fuyumi, I love you. God, I love you, but I'm tired of this. Shoto said it. He wasn't my father. He was my abuser, and for years, I've watched you protect him and defend him. Mom and Toya and I have stood against them. Shoto has given him a chance, but they've never pretended to forgive him. But you've supported him for years. Sometimes I feel like you don't even believe us when we try to tell you he's hurt us. Shoto nodded, looking at the ground again. Me too. Who are you going to choose for Yumi? Natsu said. Him or us? I, I don't want to choose. Fuyumi said, eyes wide. Tamara pursed her lips, seeming unsure whether to settle things again. 
Well, I don't care, Natsu said, crossing his arms. Because I'm offering you an ultimatum. This isn't for Toya or Shoto, this is for me. You can either stand by me and everyone else and be my sister, or you can stick with Dad and go no contact again. Because I can't keep going to family gatherings, waiting for you to try and bring up Dad and make me relive all the abuse he put me through, trying to justify and excuse it. Toya swallowed hard, then slowly nodded. Me too. He choked out. Fimi, I don't know if you know this, but he's the reason I died. He... Fimi froze. He used to train you, didn't he? Toya nodded. He stopped. Once Shoto was born, my body wasn't built to handle my quirk. He never took me to a doctor. He never tried to help me. He just used me until he didn't need me anymore. Fuck, he used to beat me when he found out I'd been trying to practice on my own. And so when things got too bad, I had no way of controlling it. That's... That's why I died. Because he let me down when I needed him the most. Another long moment stretched out. Toya shut his eyes. Then Fuyumi broke the silence. I pick you. What? Toya's eyes flew open. Fuyumi's face was tear-streaked, angry and lost and hopeful all at once but it was set with determination. I don't want to cling to some half-formed memories of dad, she said, looking down. Not when I have you right in front of me. I, the more I hear, the more he reminds me of some of the bullies I've taught in my class. A lot of them I didn't initially realize were picking on the other kids because they'd always seem so sweet. But once I found out the truth, I never once doubted a kid. I don't want to do that to my own siblings, even if it is dad. Toya grabbed onto Fiyumi and held her tight, burying his face in her shoulders, letting a sob rip through him. She held him back, gently stroking his back. I'm sorry, Toya. I'm so sorry. I'm so fucking sorry. Can I join? Shoto asked dully, and Toya nodded. Shoto loosely placed their arms around them. For about five minutes, they sat like that, Natsu joining in to complete the sibling hug. When they broke away, Toya smirked. How are you going to break the news to dad? Fuyumi bit her lip and sighed. Sooner the better, probably. I could call him, but he's probably at work, so... She looked up to see three sets of eyes. Tamara had closed hers, rubbing her temples in a silent prayer for patience. Gazing at her. Oh god, no. I'm not doing it. Please, Shoto whispered. Puppy eyes so wide it looked like their face might split open in sappy, adorable fluff. With sprinkles on top? Natsu chimed in, shit eating grin on his lips. Toya blinked myopically, blue doe eyes filling with pleading tears. Fuyumi sighed, putting her burning face in her hands. Fine. Pulling out her phone, she went to her text, found the one labeled Dad, and opened up a new message. Weekly, she asked. What should I write? Chapter 33 has art by the author, so I shall be adding that to the video, as well as the art in chapter 34. Chapter 34 It was around 4am when they finally collapsed back into the apartment, landing in a heap against the spruce floor. Hawks was pretty sure he'd never been this sore in... ever, and he was getting railed by a fucking flame god most days. Fiumi should be back from drinks with her teacher squad soon, Rumi bemoaned, as she sat up and rubbed at her eyes. So you guys have like 10 minutes to scram. You're kicking us out? Tomorrow rasped, rubbing at her eyes and effectively ruining the last of her eyeliner. Yeah, I live here, dumbasses. Rumi rolled over onto her stomach, slowly getting up. What's your excuses? Do you do this regularly? Hawks asked. Rumi and Tomura shook their heads. Fuyumi isn't big on clubbing. Hawks didn't point out that usually he wasn't either, instead opting to simply groan in pain. The only one who didn't seem completely dead on their feet was Kaiju, who had been sitting snug in Muraki's arms the whole night, including when they climbed in through the window of the bar, and promptly been kicked out for bringing a Pomeranian in. Hawks vaguely remembers Rumi trying to tell the man that if there's no pets allowed, then Hawks shouldn't be allowed either, being Dobby's pet bird and all. Needless to say, it had been a confusing time. After that, they found the lit storefront of the supermarket, which was emptier, 
and full of workers too tired to care about the number one and two heroes drunkenly running in with the barefoot villain with holding a dog. After purchasing another bottle of champagne and a watermelon, Hawks had been privy to the honestly glorious sight of Rumi cracking open the watermelon between her thighs, thick juicy red spilling onto the concrete as Tomura cackled from the background. They then attempted to use the surviving bits as a bowl, pouring in the liquor and taking turns drinking out of it. That was some of the worst. The rest of it was a hazy blur, which Hawks was sure he'd regret finding out about sooner or later. God save him. He hated every single decision of his life right now. Except dating Toby. Maybe. God, he wanted to be kissing Toby right now. Not half dead on his best friend's apartment floor, waiting for his boyfriend's sister to get home and kick him and the other two bitches. One literally being a dog, the other just being Tomura Shigaraki, infesting her homes out. Finally, they pulled themselves up and stumbled out. Hugs got out his phone, shit, the battery had gotten pretty low, and dialed Ogawa. She picked up on the second ring. What did you do? Who's to say I did anything? Hugs griped, annoyed she jumped to that conclusion. Right, sorry, she conceded. Hi, what's up? I need help, Hawks said. Ogawa let out a long-suffering sigh. Bail money, rescue squad, or just pick up? Pick up? Hawks asked, hopefully, and she grumbled something before pausing. Oh, right, you can't hear me nod. Yeah, I'll be there in maybe half an hour. Depends on where you are. Text me the address. Then she hung up, and Hawks sent her the location, slumping by the entrance. Muraki plopped down beside him, hugging Kaiju to her chest. Hey, she said, nudging his shoulder. Hawks let out a hiss and remembered that, oh fuck, he had a tattoo now, and another set of piercings in his ear, and another set of piercings in his ears, and a wicked hangover that did not mesh well with Tomura's scratchy voice. We match now. She tucked her shirt slightly lower, letting the top of her sunflower tattoo poke out. Hawks half hummed and half groaned in acknowledgement. Mm. Forcing himself to actually not be a dick, he asked, Why sunflower? Tomara turned bright red and hid her face in her dog. None of your business. Hawks blinked, mind remembering some lost piece of knowledge he'd once understood. Doesn't... Isn't that what Natsu calls you? Muraki let out a faint dying noise, and Hawks tried to laugh, then groaned when his head screamed in echoing disdain at his poor life choices. Don't you fucking speak ever again. She groaned, and Hawks just shook his head, unable to fight off the smile creeping over his face. I will dust your scrawny bird ass. Then he had another thought, one a lot more sober than he felt right now but one he still didn't know if he'd ever get the chance to ask again. Hey, Tomura, what made you want to stop being a villain? Tomura bodily flinched, head snapping up. She met his eyes, searching for something, and seemed to find it, whatever it was. Looking back down, she scratched Kaiju behind his ears, breathing in and out. It was airy, she said softly, mouth twitching down slightly. Both of us grew up raised by villains, but she never seemed angry that they didn't save her sooner. Heroes were something good to her. If I kept killing heroes, she might end up like me. I didn't want her to be anything like me. At the end of the day, all I had was anger. I hated everything and everyone. Her voice was quiet, barely there. It sucked ass. Call me selfish, but fuck, I just didn't want to be miserable anymore, okay? I don't support all heroes, but I can't survive just hating everything. I didn't do it for society, or because I had an awakening and became an amazing person. It was for me. Because I wanted to be happy, and I wasn't sure I even knew what that was. So I tried to find it. He blinked. I don't think that's selfish. Tomura laughed, then winced. Congrats. You're officially the eighth person to tell me that. Achievement unlocked. You fixed my problems. Collect 20 XP. She sighed. I don't fucking believe it. Dad and not, I love them, but they're blind where it really matters. Doesn't mean I won't take the support, though. 
I don't regret it. Hawks wondered if he was still drunk, because he didn't think at all about the next words he said. Hey, can I hug you? Tomura stared, looking slightly disturbed. You, why the hell? Hawks grimaced. I don't know, you just looked sad for a moment, and I felt bad for you. Tomura scoffed. Still such a damn hero all the time. You guys never change, do you? I don't want your pity. I can pity myself just fine. And then she pulled him in, wrapping pale, bony arms around his chest. It was a type of hug where it seemed the main goal was to crack as many ribs as possible. But Hawks didn't really mind. He wrapped his arms back around Shigaraki Tomura. It was starting to rain, the gray heaven splashing on the street, and he was sitting barefoot on the rough pavement under the awning of his best friend's apartment complex, clinging onto the girl who was both the former target of his biggest undercover job and possibly his future sister-in-law. Kaiju whined, plying tiny claws at his stomach until Mar let go, hoshing the puff with a few soothing strokes to his head. Her arms were thin, but the thick, darkened scars threading through them held more strength than anything Hawks thought one could physically convey. In a way, it was like Dobby's old scars. The dog lapped at the tip of her nose, and she scrunched her face, letting out a bubbly sound, almost like a giggle. It was one of the first times that she hadn't seemed to carry some innate sense of danger around her. And somehow, that made her seem even more dangerous. At that moment, a red Honda pulled up, the window rolling down. Get in, loser, Ogawa called, raising an eyebrow, and Hawks perked up. Coming. Horaki stood up behind him, and he turned to her. Is Natsu picking you up? She had the grace to look vaguely sheepish for a moment, turning her face. No, actually, she was just sneezing. Then she turned, unabashed. I'm riding with you, dipshit. Hawks spluttered. You told me this when? Just now. Shotgun! She slid into the front seat, dog dropped into her lap, and closed the door, leaving Hawks to stand there in the rain, before he numbly clambered into the back, wings fluffing up as they dripped onto the nice leather. If you ruin my seats, you're paying for it, Ogawa commented, eyeing him through the rear view. Hawks sighed, and Muraki cackled spitefully, the fences intact again. Oh well. Take that, rich boy. Who are you? Ogawa asked, glancing at Muraki, and she grinned. I'm Natsu's girlfriend. Call me Tomura. Can I get a lift back to our apartment? The phone battery is at critical help. Ogawa nodded. Of course. Tell Natsu I said hi. Of course Ogawa would be nicer to the former number one villain than her own patient. Figures. Hawks tried to use the car ride to grab some much needed sleep, which ended up with him just listening to Ogawa and Tomura crack jokes, while wishing hard that he was back with Dobby. Dobby. God, he missed him. His pretty eyes, pretty hair, pretty laugh, pretty smile. With his brain chanting the name Dobby, he slipped out of coherence for the rest of the car ride, barely registering Tomura leaving, or then pulling up at the hospital entrance. Come on, get out, bird brain, Ogawa said softly, tapping his shoulder from the side door. Hugs pulled himself somewhere back to life, exhaustion weighing him down. His eyelids felt heavy brain fuzzy with bone-deep tiredness. Shaking his head, he stumbled into the hospital, not sure where he was going. Ogawa sighed, tugging on his sleeve to keep him in place as she checked them back in, then leading him up to the elevator. Then, suddenly, someone was there, holding him and chuckling, the sound low and humming through Hawks' body. Hey, birdie. A deep, amused voice. You look dead on your feet. Hawks wrapped arms around Dobby, letting himself fall boneless into the melting touch, letting out a relieved warble. Dobby smoothed his hair down, pressing a kiss into the messy blonde locks. What did you and those losers get up to? He murmured, lifting him up. You're welcome for the ride at 4.30 in the morning. Ogawa called after them, and Dobby flipped her off. What's this bandage on your shoulder? Did you get hurt playing too many video games? Tattoo. Hawks mumbled, too lost in the heavenly feeling of Dobby's fingers in his hair to really think. The fingers paused. Why had they stopped? Seriously? Mm-hmm. Of what? 
The fingers resumed their stroking, so Hawks didn't see much of a point in responding, so just shrugged to the best of his ability. You're an idiot, little dove. They walked through a door, and Hawks was deposited on a fluffy surface, head guided onto Dobby's lap. Get some rest. We can talk when you're not zonked out. Wait. There was something important he needed Dobby to know. What? It was... Oh. I love you. He said as clearly as he could manage. Dobby snorted. I love you too, honeybird. Hawks drifted off to sleep, one flooding through his chest and staying with him as he disappeared into the silvery liquid cave of dreams. Hawks woke up to a sharp stinging sensation. Raising his head, he hissed, squawking in pain. Sorry, baby bird. Dobby's voice came from the side and Hawks tilted his head awkwardly to see his mate cross-legged on the bed, swiping an antibacterial wipe over his shoulder. You need to clean this off or it'll get infected. Hawks blinked, good eye narrowing in on his arm and pausing. It was a clean outline of a heart in plain black, flames etched inside. Simple, but hard to deny that it meant a lot more. Don't expect me to get some feather tat anytime soon, if that's what you were playing at feather tits. Dobby said dryly, cold teasing, not pairing well with the care he was applying to Hawks' arm. Aww, Hawks said, sitting up as he came fully too. You scared of a little needle? Dobby scoffed. I used to replace my own staples burping. I'm not scared of a needle. I'm just not the sappy kind of bitch to do couple tattoos. Hawks scoffed. You know what? Fine. He reached behind him, to the confusion of Dobby, and hooked a hand onto his wings. What are you? Dobby started, brows furrowing. Hawks yanked, ripping out one of his brand new secondary feathers, one of the only fully formed ones. Holding it out, he set it in Dobby's hand. This is for you, he said, determined, and trying to ignore the ache left in his back. Keep it, please. Dobby stared at the feather, seeming too surprised to muster up a response. I... what the hell? He started then flushed pink. You didn't have to do that. Hawks huffed. If you get to take me out to see movies and all that human dating stuff, I get to court you. Dobby considered that, then ducked his head, cheeks darkening further as he opened his mouth to respond. You know, there's an old tradition from pre-court times that... He stood, crossing the room and opening a drawer, rummaging through before he found a pair of scissors. Picking one of the longest strands of ivory hair, he gathered a lock and with a deft motion, clipped it from his head. Hawks felt his heart skip a beat as Dobby walked back, holding it out. Lovers would give each other a lock of their hair, so that even when apart, they could have a part of each other with them. His lips quirked into a faint smile. I've got your feather, so you should have the human equivalent. That's... Hawks head spun. Either the most romantic thing I've ever had someone do for me, or the creepiest thing ever. You gave me your feather, bitch. Dobby shoved them in the non-tattooed shoulder. Now I have to keep this thing from getting damaged. My feathers are pretty much invincible, Dobbs. How the hell do I keep a strand of hair intact? Hulk scribed. Dobby shrugged. You're a problem now. I'm gonna go bug Haruka into helping me put this in a chain. I mean, it'd make a pretty wicked necklace. Hawks loped after him down the hall, grumbling. Finally, he gave up, tone softening. How did family therapy go? Dobby breathed out, shaking his head. Good. I mean, we got where we needed to. Things are... Things are okay. But also, like, it was fucking heartbreaking. And I spent most of last night just sobbing and looking at cat videos. Oh, baby. Hawks frowned. I wish I could have been there for you. It's okay. Dobby laughed. I mean, I am going to make you watch those videos with me later. But for now, I need you to tell me what the hell happened last night. Hawk scowled. Why do I have to drag up all my dirt? Dobby smirked. Okay, if you want something. Fuyumi sent NG a text telling him she's disowning him. Hawks' mouth dropped open. What the- Oh my fucking- What did it say? Dobby snickered. We went with, roses are red, violets are blue. You're a shit dad, I'm disowning you. 
with a picture of a cat with bread on its head. It was brilliant. I just wish I could have seen his face. Hux choked, doubling over with laughter. Oh my god, that's so great. You're crazy. Possibly. Dobby twirled Hux's feather through his fingers. But you're crazy too. You chopped off your hair for me. I ripped out a part of my wing for you. We're both crazy. Hux slotted his fingers together with Dobby's, pulling him down the hall and spinning him around. Oh, birdie. Dobby crooned, tilting Hux's chin up to meet his eyes. Blue eyes flashing with fire, sending shivers down Hux's spine. That's not even the top 10 craziest things I've done. Am I on there? Hux asked, touching Dobby's cheek and stealing a glance down to his smooth lips. Definitely, Dobby assured, for you're the only one I don't regret. Hux kissed him, hand running through his hair. The only thing I regret is not finding you sooner. I think you found me at exactly the right time. I don't think who I was at the start was someone who would have given you what you deserved. I mean, I still can't give you all you deserve. I can't even give you half, really. But I can give you all of me. And hope it's enough. It's more than enough. Hawks told him. But you shouldn't give me all of you. You should share it. That way, we can both have someone like you. Dobby touched the lock of hair in Hawks' hand. Well... If you won't have all of me, will you at least keep a part of me? Hugs chuckled, kissing the corner of Dobby's mouth. Sure. He kissed him again, this time against his lips, savoring the shape and texture. I'll braid it into a bracelet or necklace or something, so I can keep it with me. Come on, 